is this is this site specifically, but it's also kind of this overall view of why do we care about mammoths when we're talking about communities that are living in the Pleistocene um, in North America? So I'll kind of start by giving a little bit of background about um, what, um, what mammoths are, kind of where we see them, what other elephant-like species um, or related to elephant species do we see in North America, what Laprelle itself can tell us about these time periods, um, and then also why Laprelle is particularly interesting when we talk about Pleistocene peoples because it has a camp at it. Um, and what, what does that camp mean? So really, since the discovery of um, particularly Clovis points in association with extinct fauna, particularly mammoths, uh, in, at the Blackwater Draw site uh, in New Mexico in the 1930s, there's really been this fascination among archaeologists, members of the public, and um, at any interested communities about kind of how and why people hunted these animals. And really, an image like the one you see here has become one of the iconic images of the Clovis time period, um, where there's this small group of hunters with tipped spears pursuing this uh, mammoth that is, you know, multiple tons big. Um, and uh, is, is, you know, this large kind of prized game animal. And for a long time, you know, this was very wrapped up with our traditional understanding of um, kind of early humans in North America, with the original depiction being Clovis are um, these big game hunters who followed these species across the Beringian land bridge, uh, came down into North America and really for focused all of their life around these species. Now, certainly, um, in more recent time periods, we've had a number of sites that pushes back that time scale before um, the Clovis time period. Uh, and we also know that or there's certainly been discussions about how Clovis diet was more than just big game. Um, but it's still this iconic image um, of the Clovis time period, um, which is one of the earliest um, you know, communities that we see in North America and is also um, one of the uh, only kind of, well, really the only um, projectile point typology that we see that spans coast to coast. Now, part of the reason why this image is so iconic is because if we look at the sites that we often use to talk about Clovis peoples, a good number of them have proboscidean remains at them. Uh, now, when I talk about proboscideans, basically what I'm talking about are the, those elephant-like species um, that were found across the continent uh, at the end of the last ice age, um, and they then went extinct at the end of the last ice age. And this includes actually a number of different genera of elephant-like species. You probably have mostly heard of the mammoth, um, which comes in both the woolly mammoth form, which is found more commonly in the north, uh, and then the Colombian mammoth, which is found really throughout the continent. Um, but it also includes a number of other proboscidean species, including mastodon, uh, which is also found throughout the continent, although more common in the east, where mammoths are more common often in the west. Uh, and then there's also another genus of proboscidean species called a gompothere, which you can think of as kind of the like smaller, more tropical cousin uh, to a mammoth. They're found as their, their paleontological remains are found as far north as North Carolina. Uh, and they go throughout um, uh, southern North America down into Mesoamerica uh, and are also found in South America, actually. Um, so all of these species were found uh, across North America or portions of North America at the end of the Ice Age. And in fact, we have found representatives from each of these genera um, at archaeology sites in association with cultural materials that tell us they were hunted. Um, what you see pictured on this map here are kind of the big sites that we talk about when we talk about the Clovis time period, um, which span from, depends a little bit on who you ask, but somewhere around 13,100 years ago until 12,800-ish years ago. Um, and these are the sites that we often talk about when we talk about Clovis. Now, there are many more Clovis points that have been found across um, the continent. In fact, they go coast to coast. Uh, but these sites are so often discussed um, because they were really well excavated 
Um, they have publications on them. Uh, and, you know, there's been archaeologists working at them uh, in often in varied components where we can really start asking these questions about what life was like in the Pleistocene. Now, the ones that you see highlighted in red here are sites that are widely accepted proboscidean kill or scavenge sites. Most of these are mammoth sites. There is one site with a gompothere uh, in northern Sonora called Findel Mundo, and there are two sites um, with mastodon remains um, that are also found where we find those with cultural materials. So this kind of iconic image is based on something, um, but there's also more interesting questions to ask than just kind of how these animals were hunted. And that's partially because what you eat um, and kind of how often you would be going after big game animals is gonna have really big influences on how you structure the rest of your life. Um, so for instance, um, what we know is that, uh, you know, there's lots of discussion in Clovis about something like diet breath. If diets were really focused on these big game animals, um, you know, in smaller species and plants were a smaller component of the diet, or if the diet was much more what we call generalized, meaning there's a lot of species that are included in it. And it's not just all about this big game, which tends to be the image that we really see dominant in the record or in depictions of this time period. But this also has repercussions for residential mobility. So basically, how often do you move your house? Um, if you're going to be hunting these big game consistently, you're going to want to be pretty residentially mobile because you can basically follow your food source as you go. Um, and we do know from a number of studies during this time period that people were pretty residentially mobile. They were moving their homes pretty long distances compared to later uh, or more recent time periods. Um, and uh, they were moving uh, pretty frequently as well. Now, this also has really interesting implications for division of labor. Um, there's been some ethnographic work um, done that has shown, uh, and here this is reference to some work done by Nicole Wagespeck, that shows that as ethnographic hunter-gatherers have higher percentages of meat in their diet, um, what we tend to see is that the division of labor changes and that there are more tasks that are performed predominantly by women that are not subsistence-based. So basically, as there is more meat in the diet, we often see women taking over more tasks like home maintenance, fire maintenance, um, hide processing, uh, firewood collecting, kind of all this other stuff that needs to happen to be able to kind of live your day-to-day -day life. Now, there's also obviously other interesting questions about technologically how these animals were hunted. Um, and by looking at this record of proboscidean hunting, we can learn more about what methods were used to hunt these animals and what uh, technologies were used kind of beyond just projectile points for their processing. Now, finally, there's also long been debates in archeology span about why some of these Pleistocene species went extinct and if humans may have had, had a hand uh, in contributing to the extinction of these species. These debates are often called the overkill debates, basically. Um, did these species go extinct because environment changed, or was it because people were hunting them, or some mix of both of those factors? And by looking at these proboscidean sites, we can start asking and answering questions that are kind of related to this, some of these which are directly related to hunting these animals. Now this was kind of paint this bigger picture. So these types of questions and this framework was what we headed into um, when we started working on the Laprell site. Now, for a little bit of background about Laprell, um, the site was originally discovered in 1986 um, when two locals um, from the nearby town of Douglas were walking along Laprell Creek uh, and they noticed these large bones protruding from this bank right next to um, the creek. Uh, and they realized that these were definitely larger than any animals we see today. Um, and eventually, um, archaeologists at the University of Wyoming, particularly the very well-known Plains um, Pleistocene archaeologist, Dr. George Frizen, uh, was notified. And in the spring of 1987, he traveled to site to test it with a small crew. Now, the Laprell site, and hopefully this drone video doesn't glitch people out, it will be over quickly, uh, the Laprell site is located in eastern um, central Wyoming, basically between the towns of Douglas and Casper. Um, and here you can see an overview of the site. 
um, while we're working on it one summer. It sits right along Laprelle Creek uh, and is in uh, one of the terraces that's next to the site itself. This site sits about a mile from the North Platte River, which is one of the major waterways that runs through this region. So we're very close to a major water source um, that would have intermittently flooded over the last 13,000 years and certainly contributed to kind of this site being buried eventually. Now, the site itself sits pretty deep in this terrace, about three meters deep. Um, so it's, we have very deeply buried deposits that make excavation a little more difficult. There is no other archaeology in that th those deposits that sit on top of this um, Pleistocene surface. So we're able to use um, backhoes, which is one of the ways that we've been able to excavate so many portions of the site. Now, in 1987, when Dr. Frizen and his crew came onto site, they opened up an approximately three by four um, excavation uh, block, um, which you can see open here. They dug all of this down by hand, you know, use a backhoe, thankfully. Um, uh, and they discovered the remains uh, or the partial remains of a sub-adult Colombian mammoth. So you can see right here is a rib cage of a mammoth. Um, and all of our excavators are working. Now, among this partial remains of the mammoth, um, well, before I say that, uh, this mammoth was a subadult because some of the bones weren't fully fused, um, but this was not like a little mammoth. This was nearly a fully grown uh, Colombian mammoth. This would be larger um, than any of the extant elephant species that we see across the world today. So this is a very large animal. We only have partial remains of the animal itself. We have um, one half of the rib cage and a number of the axial elements. So basically center of the body elements. Um, and we have lost a portion of the mammoth remains down the creek. So remember this site was discovered because it was eroding out. So we've lost an unknown portion of the site. What they did find in 1987, um, was some flakes that were interspersed throughout this, so left over from napping of stone tools, uh, and also one stone tool, um, one flake tool that you see pictured up here. And the impression was that this site was probably culturally associated and probably was a mammoth butchery site, um, but it was kind of left as a question. Now, in 2014, myself and my co-PIs um, returned to the site to basically resolve this question. Is this cultural? Is this not cultural? Um, and what, what can it tell us about life in the Pleistocene? Now, I should note this project has been a collaboration from the beginning. Uh, I, can take, I can never take all of the credit for this project. Uh, my collaborators include Drs. Todd Surabell, um and Bob Kelly, both from the University of Wyoming. Uh, also, Dr. Spencer Pelton, uh, who is now the Wyoming State Archaeologist, um, and Dr. Matt O'Brien, who is at CSU Chico and does a lot of our zooarchaeological work. And basically, we've been working on this site um, since 2014. We've taken a couple summers off, but we've been out there every year kind of seeing if this is a cultural site. Now, the obvious place to start is where the mammoth came out. Um, so when we first returned in 2014, um, we basically immediately worked on identifying where the original excavation block was, and we're lucky enough to find actually the corner nail for this corner here that, that had been left in place since 1987 um, in our first like four hours on site, which was an incredible stroke of luck. Um, and what we worked on was expanding our excavations around this original 1987 block. Now, I think all of us had dreams of like big mammoth tusks and like casting giant bones and we really didn't find that many mammoth remains. Uh, the 1987 crew really covered the majority of the bone bed. Basically the largest piece of mammoth remain we found since that time period um, can be depicted here, which this is a navicular. So basically a foot bone uh, of a mammoth and it was found uh, in the top portion of this block. We did find a number of additional stone tools, mostly in the form of debitage, so those waste flakes from resharpening a stone tool. You can see an example of some of those pictured here. I'll note that this scale here is 10 millimeters, so that is one centimeter. Um, so these are teeny tiny little pieces of resharpening um, from stone tool flakes. Um, and we found about a total of 60 of these um, all around this bone bed. We also did some uh, additional analysis on the original 
um, stone tool. Uh, and we determined that it was positive for elephant protein residue, which basically means that this stone tool at some point in the past was in contact with mammoth blood. Um, so once again, kind of suggesting that this has been associated with mammoth butchery. Now, this story together is certainly interesting in the sense that it kind of confirms this classic image of Clovis, you know, taking down or at least butchering this large game animal. Um, and that may have been kind of the end of the story of Laprowl if it wasn't for an incredible stroke of luck. So over here is our excavation for this site, and down here is our screening area. We screen all of the dirt on site, the sediment on site, through 16-inch mesh, so basically window mesh. Um, and so we have to carry buckets of sediment from up here down to our water screen. I know my students look absolutely freezing in this photo. I promise you it was July and it was, you know, it's Wyoming. It's a little cold, but it was July and they were not freezing, as freezing as they look. Um, so to enable carrying buckets across this slope, um, we were excavating a little trail into it. Um, actually, one of our uh, a retired archaeologists in the Office of the Wyoming State Archaeologist, Dr. Rich Adams, was digging this path. Um, and while he was digging it right around here, he hit this. Now, this is not the most beautiful tool in the world, but it was really important for this site. So basically what this is, is this is a river cobble, probably came right out of this creek, um, but it has a couple flakes taken off of it. We also know that the deposits that the mammoth are sitting in are very, very low energy, meaning they naturally don't have really large rocks like this in it. Um, and this was found about 10 meters away from the mammoth in exactly the same elevation and stratigraphic position as the mammoth remains. So suddenly our site that was this big became potentially this big. And we started asking the question of, well, what else could be around this mammoth uh, that could tell us about life in the Pleistocene? Uh, and this really set us off on this journey that has lasted at this point you know, nine years. So as the site stands today, we have excavated, I think we're nearly or just over about 200 square meters um, of this site. Up here is where our mammoth came out of. Our chopper tool that I just showed you came out of over here and we have significantly expanded the site. And that's basically because what we determined is that while this mammoth was being butchered, there were people who were camping immediately next to it um, that were, um, you know, processing the mammoth, uh, living their day-to-day -day lives, uh, that can tell us so much more about the Clovis time period than just, um, just kind of a set of mammoth remains that have some stone tools in them. So basically how our research design has worked is that every year that we've come back to site, we've just been looking for additional concentrations of artifacts. So we started with our site focusing here in 2014, um, and 2015. In 2016, we started excavating right around those chopper remains and then expanding out with test units, um, which is a little bit difficult given the depth of the site because it becomes dangerous to have really deep one by one holes. So we open up portions of the site with a backhoe and then excavate just through those archaeological materials um, in careful excavation mode. In 2017, we found an additional concentration of artifacts directly west of the mammoth, um, and we focused our excavations on those. Then in 2019, we started moving uh, down further south to the site. And in 2021 and 2022, um, we even focused further west of this southern area. And in each of these spaces, um, what we found is kind of concentrations of human activity. So, um, just for reference, and I will continually reference this again, the way that we call these different blocks are blocks A, which is where our mammoth remains are, block B, which is where our big chopping tool is, block C, which is west of the mammoth, and then block D, which is this new area that we've excavated in the last few years. Now, for an example of kind of what we're seeing in some of these spaces, we can turn to the first uh, block that we excavated, which we call block B or the chopper block, um, given the chopper tool that was found there. Um, now here you can see an example of our excavation methods here. Basically, once we find a concentration of artifacts, we open up this big block excavation 
um, and then divide that further into 50 by 50 centimeter squares that are five centimeters deep. So everything on site, we get down to an area that's about 50 by 50 by five. Um, and we know exactly kind of what materials come out of that. Now, it was immediately evident that something different than what had been found before was going on at this site because of one of our first kind of finds in Block B. And that was a really large concentration of red ochre. Um, so this image here is a picture of Block B. And you'll notice that there are these concentrations that look red or pink. Uh, and what that is is hematite. So hematite is a natural red pigment that is iron um, associated. Uh, it's a mineral. Um, this is really nice hematite that we see on this site. It's very silky and smooth. Um, and this could be used for a variety of purposes, making paint, coloring hides, um, ritual, certainly ritual purposes, um, kind of all of these things going on. Now, a little bit easier way to see how big and dense this stain is, is if we color enhance it using a program called D-Stretch. So this just changes kind of the color spectrum that you see on your photos. It's traditionally used for rock art, but it works in this case here. And you'll see this really dark red area. It's about two and a half meters long by a meter and a half wide. Um, and throughout this entire excavation block, we also spot, shot in 1,200 little tiny chunks of ochre. Um, so this is certainly more than we would have seen naturally in this area, and this is something that was brought in um, by the community and the people that were living here. Now, throughout this ochre scene, we also found a number of other materials. We found a small collection of stone tools. So here you see our chopping tool, and then on the right are a variety of other um, stone tools. Most of these are just flake tools. You can think of them like a pocket knife, uh, basically. Um, or we have some resharpened edge, edges and they would be used for kind of general tasks. We also have a little portion of an end scraper that was fractured in a fire um, that would have been used for processing hides. All of these stone tools um, are made out of materials that probably come from what we call the Hartville Uplift, which is about 50 miles-ish um, southeast from the Laprell site. Um, and uh, I will also note that the ochre stain that you see there, we have tentatively chemically traced that also to a known ochre source in the Hartville Uplift called the Powers 2 site. Um, so we know that kind of that is one of the places where these people had been before they came to Lapel itself. Now, in addition to stone tools and ochre, we also found some work bone in the form of bone needles. So here you can see a number of bone needle fragments. We think this represents at least three different bone needles. This one here on the lower left still has a little portion of its eye, as you can see. Um, and these are teeny tiny. So this is 15 millimeters, a centimeter and a half. Um, these are some of the oldest, if not the oldest, bone needles south of uh, Alaska, south of the ice sheets. Um, and while well, they are tiny, um, they are in line with the other bone needles that we see um, slightly later in time from the Pleistocene time periods. Now, on the lower right, we also have another work bone artifact that we found in that ochre stain. You can still see there's some ochre stain dirt stuck to it. Um, and we think this is probably a bead. Um, it has some worked edges, some uh, cut marks on it, um, and is also very tiny. This is a half centimeter um, all in one area. Now, in addition to the artifacts that we found in this area, their spatial distribution was really interesting for telling us about how people lived uh, in the past. Um, now, while we were excavating this, we didn't find any traditional indicators of a fire feature or a hearth. Um, so there were no char concentrations of charcoal. There was no oxidate oxidation, suggesting that the, the sediments had been heated. Um, but what we did notice when we got back to the lab is that we had a number of artifacts that showed indications of burning. And this include, included calcined bone. So this is bone that has been heated really, really hot. Um, and basically it chemically changes and turns white and chalky in color. Um, and we noticed that most of our calcined bone really centered in, uh, in a single location right next to, or kind of edge of this ochre stain. We also had a number of lithics, flakes, that were burned um, and that showed indications of burning. And those also focused in in this same specific area of um, the excavation. And we started to think, 
that there probably was a hearth in this location, but it's something that is now invisible. So basically those kind of classic charcoal concentrations, oxidation weren't preserved, but the artifacts themselves and their distribution of burning can tell us where this hearth used to be. And this is based off a method that was um, developed by uh, in 2005 by uh, an archeologist by the name of Surgent um, and, research and other colleagues, uh, and is something that has been done at other sites. Now, another way that we worked on identifying where this hearth came out of was by looking at the distribution of um, density of artifacts in one space versus how many of them were burned. Uh, and this is based on some work that one of my colleagues, uh, Todd Serville, um, and Nicole Wagaspec did at a different site called the Barger Gulch site in the Rocky Mountains. And what they found out is that outside of hearth areas, we generally see this wedge-shaped distribution, where there may be a lot of artifacts in one excavation area, but not many of them are burnt. Or if there is burned artifacts, there's only a few artifacts in that space. But if you find a location where there are a high density of artifacts and a lot of them are burned, that can tell you where a hearth is. So we basically took these three independent lines of evidence and put them all together um, and were able to guess, and all of them um, were concentrated within about 30 centimeters of each other. Um, and we were able to determine that there probably was a hearth in this portion of the site located right around here, right on the edge of the ochre stain. Now, this is really important when we talk about understanding past life because hearths are really important when we talk about how hunter-gatherers use space. Um, and what we see is that if we look at um, ethnographic um, accounts of communities that are foragers or are mo highly mobile, so some of our pastoral groups um, that use a lot of domesticated animals, hearths are often kind of the centerpiece of these households. Um, they're spaces that give heat, and light and warmth. Um, and there's something that people use to cook. Uh, and they're really important spaces for socializing, for eating, for daily experiences in life. Um, and we see this over and over again in tons of different ethnographic accounts that hearth and fire are super important for communities. Now, they're certainly also important for agriculturalists. Uh, and we can all think how these are also important spaces in our own camps today, right? If you go camping, a hearth is kind of that bringing together point uh, where you cook, where you socialize, where you hang out, right? But in hunter-gatherers, we also often see hearths be that center point of a household itself. Now, they're also really important archaeologically because they allow us to start seeing past just some of these classic questions in archaeology that are certainly very important, um, but ask something a little bit different. So for instance, we can actually use hearths to see architecture. There are hearths that are placed outside and they are often used for hearths, different things than hearths that are placed inside. And we can use hearths, and I'll talk about this in a moment, to see if something is outside or inside. Now, another reason why hearths are really important is they allow us to reach past these typical questions that we talk about in archaeology. Lots of times when you hear archaeologists talk, they're talking about um, things like economic questions. So what are people eating? or technological questions, what stone tools are people making, where are they getting those stone tools from, um, which is also a question about mobility, right? Where, do you, where, where were you before you were here? Now, these are all certainly really important questions, and the reason archaeologists often talk about them is because they're the thing that we can easily get to, because we often have stone tools and animal remains. But when we start having a hearth, we can start asking questions about things like social organization or division of labor, um, or kind of what everything else that is going on in a camp. Um, and this allows us to give a much more humanistic view of the past, because it isn't just um, hunting large game animals, it's kind of reconstructing day-to-day -day life. Also, if we have a hearth, they're often associated with domestic spaces. If we're talking about a domestic space, we're talking about a space that is used by everyone men, women, children, elderly, kind of all portions of the population are going to be using those spaces. So we can start talking about everyone that is present in a camp instead of just this hunting focused imagery that we often tend to associate with men when we talk about reconstructions in archeology. span 
Now, I mentioned that one of the things that we can do with a hearth is start talking about um, architecture. So how do we do this? Well, really what this question comes down to um, is the identification of interior versus exterior spaces. Um, and this is based on a lot of work that was done by an archaeologist by the name of um, Stapert, uh, particularly working on the Paleolithic era. And basically how this works is that if you're in an interior space, so an inside space, there's walls around. And those walls restrict artifact movements, right? So you can kind of think of this in two different ways. Here we have a side view of a, a superstructure, right? An interior space. And here, this is a top-down view. So in both of these, there is a hearth as the centerpiece, which we often, you know, we know is quite common uh, in hunting and gathering communities, uh, forging communities. And we see a hearth here pictured as this red dot. Now, when you're working in an interior space, a hearth is an attractor. It's heat and it's light. So what we see is, Artifacts get distributed often right around this hearth, and we call this the hearth drop zone. Now, lots of times there is a concentration up against this hearth because people aren't going to walk right next to you in open fire, right? You're going to take a couple steps back. Um, so basically, artifacts tend to collect right up against this hearth. Then there's a little bit of shuffle space that is either from people moving around or from people sweeping up also, right? Um, and then you basically get what we call the barrier effect. And you can think of this when you camp in a tent, right? There's that corner of the tent that you have um, that is really close to the wall and you can't quite sit all the way up against it because um, you're kind of crouched down because the wall is coming up behind you. So you often use that space for storage or maybe sleeping, right? Um, but you can't just push materials through a wall. So what we see is that artifacts will preferentially um, kind of bunch up against this barrier. So we can actually see this in the spatial distribution of an artifact. If you plot artifact frequency with this being the center of the hearth and this being the number of artifacts, what we start seeing is a bimodal distribution. There's a peak in this hearth drop zone and then there is a peak at this barrier effect. And that tells us that this is an interior space. If your hearth is in an exterior space, there's no barrier. Now, this hearth may still be an attractor for activity, so you may still have that hearth drop zone, but there's not going to be a backstop that is stopping materials from going further away. So what we end up with is here's our hearth center, and we either end up with just an increasing amount of artifacts as you go further out, or you end up with something that looks much more unimodal, um, so single peak in distribution. Um, and that's because this, this hearth drop zone that is attracting activity and then people aren't really paying attention to where stuff goes or not working, dropping stuff as much a little bit further away. And we applied this idea to this hearth at La Prel, um, And what we found is that the distribution of things like chipstone, ochre, and bone fragments is more consistent with an interior space than an exterior space. Um, so it looks like this is the in, an interior structure potentially a house um, or a domestic space. Um, and you can even see this in this um, lithics bubble map here where larger bubbles mean more artifacts, right? There's a big concentration and it's circular. Um, and also interestingly, the circular concentration basically wraps around that ochre stain, suggesting that whatever was going on with the ochre was probably happening inside. Now, all of this portion of the site together where we have a variety of stone tools. We have worked bone, including bone needles, this large amount of ochre, and a hearth that's probably inside. We also found a few faunal remains here, um, and we think most of them are bison, although we're working on zooarchaeology by mass spectrometry, a new method um, to identify these. This is undeniably something that we would call a camp. It's just unusual because it's, you know, like 10 meters away from a mammoth. Um, so we're looking at the camp that was probably occupied as this mammoth was being butchered. Now, our block that was directly west of the mammoth, we're seeing a very similar pattern, albeit with way less um, variety in archaeological materials. Um, so here you see a preliminary, we're still working on picking through this portion of the site, 
um, a preliminary count of some of the lithics. And once again, you see that there's a pretty circular distribution that's starting to develop. Um, and we suspect that there is a hearth, again, based off burn artifact densities, although we don't have the final numbers that are at the center of this, um, and that this is probably an interior space. We also found some faunal remains, also bison, uh, in this region of the site. Um, but there was one thing that was very different, well, apart from the lack of ochre and bone needles, uh, but that was very different about this portion of the site compared to the other, and that was the stone school assemblage. Um, so here are the three largest pieces of stone tools we found in this portion of the site. This, uh, from my recollection, is five centimeters. Um, so these are pretty small. And they're a very different raw material type than the Hartville uplift that we see in Block B. We think, based on some work being done by uh, Chase Mahan, who is a PhD student at University of Wyoming, um, that this stone tool is coming out of Southwest Wyoming. Now, our other area of the site had stone tools, Block B had stone tools coming out of the Hartville Uplift. So we're seeing very different types of lithic raw materials come onto the site. Now, interestingly, this, these outcrops in Southwest Wyoming that we think these are coming from, um, this is right down the Sweetwater River, which runs into the North Platte, which runs right by La Prelle site. This is also basically where the Oregon Trail ran, like the historic Oregon Trail, um, because it's a really easy way to walk across that portion of what is today Wyoming. Um, so potentially talking about kind of how you move across space as well at a much larger scale. Now, La Prelle is not the only site in North America um, that we have found a camp associated with Clovis butchery, but there are not many. Um, and here you can see kind of what La Prelle looked like um, in this was as of 2017. Um, and we have our mammoth remains and we have two concentrations that we're thinking are camps um, that are about 12 meters away. The other comparator we have is the Murray Springs site, which is located in um, Arizona. Uh, and there they have multiple kill localities. They have at least one mammoth kill locality and multiple bison antiquis that were also hunted over different time periods. Um, and they also have a Clovis campsite um, that we know is associated with the mam or the bison remains because there's a refit between the two, um, but it's much further away than at um, La Prelle. We're looking about 80 meters away and instead La Prelle is 10 meters away. So this is a very different kind of spatial set than what we see before, but it's also consistent with what we see in the ethnographic record. There's been a little bit of work by anthropologists where they've been able to, to um, observe communities hunting really large game like elephants. Uh, and there's a really good example from Central Africa um, with the Efe, um, who you see pictured here. And during the accounts of Efe hunting of elephants, um, what we see is when they make an elephant kill, um, they immediately send out people to bring everyone else back. And they basically set up a temporary camp about 12 meters away um, from the elephant remains um, where they have um, huts that they set up. They also set up um, drying racks for processing the elephant remains. Uh, and they occupy this camp for a short period of time while they're butchering and preserving the meat from that animal. So our thought is that's basically what's going on at La Prelle is that we're seeing the actual processing of that animal for some period of time um, after and during its butchery. Now, in 2017, the site expanded once again um, when we found a Clovis, well, what we are calling a Clovis point, uh, in a test unit um, 10 meters, about 10 meters, even further south of Block B. We were very lucky to hit this. It was actually a one by 50 centimeter test unit that we had thrown down, um, and we pulled out a partial Clovis point. You can see this side has its flute. There's also a flute on the other side of the point. Um, a former impact fracture, so this point has been resharpened. Um, and of course, we started excavating right around um, this point the following year. Now, this area of the site actually didn't produce that many artifacts. It seems to be either kind of a discard zone or somewhere in between other um, artifact concentrations. But we noticed that there were increasing frequencies of artifacts as we headed west, and this became what we eventually called Block D, which is by far the densest artifact concentration we have found at La Prelle. Um, to date, we have uh, excavated 
Um, a significant portion of this in 2021 and 2022, um, actually this is out of date, we are now over 40,000 uh, little, mostly little pieces of debitage from this area of the site. This makes up well over 90% of the site assemblage. It is many more artifacts than we see in either of the two other spaces um, on site. We're still working on um, picking this portion of the site. So these blanks are not actually blanks. It's just that those counts aren't finalized yet. And this map is about two months old. Um, and so you could fill in a little bit more um, than this. Um, but once again, what we're seeing is that there appears to be certain excavation units that have really dense concentrations of calcined bone and burn lithics. Um, and we think that there is a hearth in this portion of the site. I'm guessing that we have it down to within a meter around here, but we'll have to wait for the final burned artifact counts to rerun the spatial analysis, which hopefully will be coming in the next um, few months. Now, in addition to just a lot more lithics, we also found a bunch of other really interesting things. Um, we found a uh, lower jaw of a bison again. So this is the third kind of um, heart centered area that we found bison in. Um, so here's a picture of uh, this bison mandible. Um, we also found another a, num a number of other large bone fragments, which you, should, you can see outlined on this map here. We also found some fragments of mammoth ivory. So these two are our largest pieces of mammoth ivory. They were found in this portion um, of the block. And I should note that we had a student who was doing analysis on little tiny pieces, sub centimeter pieces um, of what we thought were ivory found in our other blocks, block C and block B. And she was using scanning electron microscopy to identify those. Molly Heron, who is a University of Wyoming master's student, uh, and she did find little pieces of ivory in some of our other excavation blocks. So while our big chunks are here, there are other spaces on site and we know we have mammoth ivory at as well. We also found more bone needles. Uh, most excitingly, this one, which has a complete eye to it, also very small. This is a centimeter um, in this portion of the site. Now, in addition to um, those artifacts, we also found a much larger tool assemblage. We have three different, what we call ultra thin biface fragments. So this is the edge of this big um, kind of reddish material that you see here. Um, these three were spread over um, a pretty about a meter, um, so not super far, but refit together, also fractured intentionally, probably in the center. We found a large assemblage of end scrapers, which you see here, and their distribution across this portion of the site. Now, when we look at this spatial distribution, we're once again thinking that this is probably an interior portion of the site. We're probably seeing a hearth somewhere around here, and the walls probably come just inside a lot of these large bone fragments. You would want to pitch your large bone fragments outside, as you can imagine, um, during these time periods. Uh, so once again, we're probably looking at some sort of domestic um, or other interior space. Now, we also found diagnostics in this region, although not quite what you would expect. We found a number of channel flakes, so for making those um, very clear flutes that we see in the Pleistocene time periods in the plains. But we also found these three fragments of this point here, which undeniably, if you found it on the surface, you would call a fulsome point. Now on the plains, fulsome traditionally follows Clovis. Um, so when we started pulling out these fragments, they, they kind of teased us all summer. Um, we found this one first, and then the next two weeks later, we found this one, and then two weeks later, we found this one over the course of our um, excavations. And they were found about two and a half to three meters apart across the whole excavation block, but clearly refit back together. Um, but this is undeniably something that if found on the surface, we would call a fulsome. Now we've obviously also been working on redating the Laprell assemblage. Um, and I won't lie to you and say it has been the simplest site to radiocarbon date, um, as you can see here. Um, we've had a number of dates on bone collagen. These were some of the earliest radiocarbon dates that were done on this site. And you'll see that it says that this mammoth is about 10,000 calendar years old. That is very young for a mammoth that is the, well after mammoths went extinct in this region. Um, so we knew that we had some uh, collagen preservation issues. But we have taken a number of dates from different portions of the archaeology site. 
Um, and our best estimate for dating, given that bone dates tend to air a little um, younger when they get contaminated, uh, is that this site was occupied about 12,950 years ago. In addition to those um, bone collagen dates on bison and mammoth, um, we also have some dates on the calcined bone that we see found throughout the site, um, and also some dates on charcoal, although often it's hard to tell if the charcoal is cultural or is natural, because we also have some natural burning going on in the site. So what does this mean if we have a Clovis and a, and a Fulse, what a, we would call Clovis and a Folsom point in one space? And we've been jokingly calling this the Flovis site. Uh, since the first kind of pull out of the top of that point, everybody was like, oh, it's a flow at this point, because um, we weren't quite sure what to call it. Um, so we can go through a few possibilities of why we see this. The first one is that the site isn't a single occupation, um, but that doesn't actually seem to be the case. And here's why. One, this site is very well spatially organized. So if we talk about looking at this site top down on an XY portion, we see there's these different concentrations of artifacts and they're all spatially separate and they don't run into each other as we would expect if kind of someone was living on the site and then left for a while and then came back, right? Also, everything vertically is in very similar, if not identical um, elevations, especially when we control for kind of what the ground surface looked like in the Pleistocene. This was a relatively flat surface in the Pleistocene. There's a little bit of, um, of uh, depth variation, but everything is exactly the same depth from our last soil that kind of sits on top of the site. Uh, and in fact, our Clovis point um, came out over here, our Folsom point came out over here, and those are from exactly the same excavation level uh, and about 12 meters apart. So vertically very consistent, meaning deposited at the same time or very close to the same time period. We also know that Block D is interacting with the mammoth because there's giant hunks of ivory in it. Um, so we, you know, this is probably a single occupation site. Now, another possibility is that there's more variation in fluted point typology than we tend to expect um, or accept uh, in the archeological record. The majority of Clovis and Folsom sites or points that are found across the country are found on the surface, right? We don't have radiocarbon dates for them. Um, and, you know, there can be some confirmation bias in the sense that you pick something up and you're like, oh, it's a fulsome point, but if you're not basing that off of a radiocarbon date, you're basing that off of what the point looks like. Um, that being said, uh, we recently had a University of Wyoming master's student, Jacob Arzen, um, do some statistics on these. Uh, and we found that this red point is statistically um, consistent metrically with Clovis, and this other point is more consistent with Folsom, suggesting that, you know, um, there is kind of two different projectile point types on the same site. So this brings us to our third possibility that seems most likely, which is that we have the production of both Clovis and Folsom technology going on on the site itself. Um, now, this is actually something that has recently been hypothesized. Briggs Buchanan and a bunch of other colleagues um, put out a paper in 2002, to, no, 2022, excuse me, um, that looked at kind of the range of Clovis dates on particularly the plains and the range of Folsom dates on the plains. And what they found is there's potentially 200 years of overlap between Clovis and Folsom uh, in the assemblages that we see now. So this is certainly possible that these technologies were made at the same time and that Laprell is actually an example of that. Now, our best guesstimate for how old Laprell is, is a little bit older than as this overlap stands, um, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility that Folsom was being made a hundred or a few hundred years earlier than we were thinking before. Now, we're also using what we're seeing at LaCrelle and the fact that this looks like a single occupation to ask different questions about the Clovis time period that talk about social organization. And particularly when we look at things like mobility, cooperation, um, and also sharing of resources. So basically how this works is we currently have three different heart-centered areas that we've excavated at LaCrelle. If we expect that everyone who is from this site is using basically household level mobility, so each household is moving on their own, 
um, then we would expect different stone tool materials to be brought on the site from different directions uh, and basically have all of those meet up at Lapel itself. Now, the other possibility is that we're seeing something like band level mobility, where multiple households are moving together, in which case we would expect all of the different hearths to have the same representation of lithic stone materials. Or we can have some sort of hybrid model, right, where there's like some um, some spaces that share a similar stone tool set and some that are different. Um, and basically that's kind of the pattern that seems to be working out at the moment in that block B and block D have both seem to have a lot of stone tool materials from uh, the Hartville Uplift. Well, block C has that very different stone tool material being used that's potentially from what is today Southwest Wyoming. Now we can also do something like this when we talk about cooperation in butchery, which is basically okay, we have these different hearths that have different stone tool materials at them. What's actually being used to process the mammoth? We have about 60 flakes um, in those mammoth remains. What lithics are those? And what heart-centered areas do those lithics come from? If everybody is actively participating in butchery, then we would expect um, all of these materials to be represented in the bone bed. Um, if only some people, or maybe if one household is in charge of butchery, um, then we would expect um, kind of one or a subset of those lithic stone tools to be used to be found in the mammoth remains themselves. Now we can also do the opposite thing, which is where are materials coming off of the mammoth and where are they going? Um, so if there's wide sharing of those mammoth remains, we would expect to see faunal remains and ivory shared throughout the different hearths. And as I mentioned, the work by Molly Heron, University of Wyoming uh, master's student uh, suggests that this is something potentially that we have where ivory is being used by multiple of these or used in multiple of these heart centered areas. Um, instead, what we could expect to see is that there's no sharing and that it's all kind of focused on one set. Um, and as far as we can tell at the moment, ivory is widely shared. We also um, think uh, the other thing we can ask this about are the bison remains we have. We know we have bison at multiple hearths. Is that one bison? Is it multiple bison? Is a bison also being shared? Um, and that can tell us something about how communities can split resources. So all of this together offers, and I'll get to your question in one second because I have one slide left. Um, uh, all of this offers kind of a very different view of um, or that uh, lets us ask kind of different questions that are much more humanistic about what's going on um, in the Pleistocene in the sense that we can start talking about things like cooperation and butchery and sharing and what domestic spaces look like during the Clovis time period and how having, you know, a large game animal that's being processed at the same time affects that. Um, and so we're working with the materials um, that we see at Laprelle to answer exactly kind of these questions um, and potentially other questions that we're currently exploring about what we can ask when we have this camp immediately associated with mammoth butchery. Now, obviously, the other question that this leads to is, well, how do we find camps at other places? Uh, and that's certainly something that I'm also actively working on is, um, you know, what are other sites that we can test for finding camps associated with proboscidean butchery or potentially other large game animals um, to be comparators for lapel um, and kind of how the Clovis is using um, space and also what that humanistic version of the past looks like. So the last thing I'll mention before I take, I know at least the one question I have. Uh, is obviously work like this is never done in isolation. Uh, there has been hundreds of people who have helped us out on this site, including my collaborators. There's been a number of people who have done independent um, research projects for us and a massive number of people who have been involved. We've also are always indebted to our funders, which have included National Science Foundation, National Geographic, Quest Archaeological Research Group, the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund, uh, the Frizen Institute, and obviously the University of Wyoming itself. Um, so, uh, always indebted to, um, all of the people that enable a large scale project like this. So that is where I leave you. And I am, I am happy to take questions. It looks like Anita may have one. Anita, do you have a question? I'm not sure. Anita, do you have your, um, your microphone no, on? 
just an accidental hand raise. It happens. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I, I can't turn on. Um, but, uh, boy, thank you very much, Madeline. We made it. Uh, appreciate recording this. Uh, anybody have uh, questions or video? Uh, it's probably better not uh, for uh, the power of our wi Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, I'll, Colin, I can run question? questions. Colin Greer's here. Let's, Colin Greer. Yeah, plenty, plenty of time for questions. Um, yeah, I can throw in a question. Okay. If you're going to throw one in. Colin, he has his hand up. This is Dr. Colin Greer. <laughs> Hey, Madeline. So, yeah, really interesting and, and careful work. Hey, University of Vancouver. All right. Do you have Thanks, a question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Am I on here? Uh, yeah, you're on. Okay. Um, yeah, really interesting and, and careful work, and obviously important stuff you're doing. Um, my question concerns you talk about the site as a, a single occupation. And I'm kind of wondering what what you mean by that specifically in terms of should we think about this place and maybe this is where your argument was going as you know a short term event a butchery mm -hmm. event in which people were there for maybe a day or two a couple of days and that's yeah. what we're represented here or do we have you know a whole season of occupation do we have maybe 10 seasons of repetitive occupation or do we have occupations maybe every few years over decades or centuries because I guess that really gets to the heart of the matter of how we can interpret this yeah. in a really synchronic versus diachronic way and I'm wondering just I know that I saw a few of the dates but hopefully I caught them all I had to, a few distractions at home but maybe you could talk about what you really think is is the occupation length and cycle here at the site yeah that's a great question so when I'm talking about single occupation, what I'm specifically meaning is all of the archaeology that we're seeing in the areas we've excavated is particularly associated with those faunal remains uh, and when those were being butchered. Now, one other thing we can talk about, which I'm happy to get to if somebody wants to ask a question, which is like, can you tell if it was kill versus scavenge, um, right? But let's set that aside for a moment. Let's just talk about animal processing. Um, and what we're thinking is that all of these are associated with these mammoth remains and potentially were occupied simultaneously. Now, another question is how long was the occupation, right? Um, which is always a very tricky question in archaeology. Um, as far as we're thinking is this was relatively short on the scale of weeks to maybe a few months, um, but it was really kind of focused in on those megafauna remains. Um, and it probably wasn't a location where people return to over and over again. Now, one thing that I will say is that for a long time, um, this is a pretty unremarkable spot in the landscape. There's nothing that like makes it stand out apart from the fact that there is like a dead mammoth right there. Um, and so our thoughts were, you know, that is acting as the attractor um, for this location and why it is single occupation. That being said, um, we recently started working on, I have a bonus slide, because um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we recently started working on an auger grid to try to kind of expand and figure out where the edges of the site are. Because one of the problems is that every time we put in a test unit, we pulled out artifacts. So we don't actually know where the edge of the site is. And as you go further west, the site gets deeper, which makes it really difficult to test um, with normal excavation units because you're like going really deep in the ground. And you have to open up a really big hole on the surface to do that. Um, so we started putting in an auger grid where we basically just screen the portions uh, that are around this kind of archaeology set. Um, last year, we finished this much of the auger grid. And the X's basically mean that we couldn't get the auger deep enough um, down. Uh, but all of the black augers are augers that had stone tool lithics in them, tiny pieces of debitage. Um, and you'll see that um, over here, we have some very far test units. We were able to put in a test unit between these two augers last year, just because of the landform surface. It was it was shallow enough that we could do it. Um, and we did find materials that came out of this test unit that were in the same stratigraphic position as the materials we're pulling from here. Um, 
we have dated stratigraphic dates. I don't think we directly dated the bone out of this yet, but it's Pleistocene certainly in age. Um, and one question is like, is this still single occupation or is this suggesting that maybe this landform was used kind of more for a longer time depth than we were originally thinking? Um, but again, when we talk about kind of these spaces immediately around, you know, these four blocks that we have, they're all spatially separated and organized in an XY way that makes it seem like all of them are being used simultaneously. And then if you control for the depth, they're all consistent in stratigraphic position. Um, and they're in a sediment. So they're not on a stable, they're not on a surface that would have been stable for a few hundred years. It's not like it's a stable soil where you can like let things accrue. Um, this site was pretty rapidly buried within a relatively short time span. Um, and we're kind of thinking that all of that points to this being one kind of event that was associated with um, those mammoth remains when those different heart centered areas were occupied. So in the fact that we have, you know, ivory in this one, um, big chunks of ivory, and then tiny pieces of ivory that probably would have shed when ivory was being worked or carried um, in these other spaces also is pretty consistent with that. Yeah, okay, yeah, really, yeah, interesting. I mean, I, I'm really sympathetic to the idea of a structureless archaeology trying to find structures. Um, yeah. Even if sometimes working in plank houses on the Northwest Coast, it's hard to identify these drop and toss zone and hearth kind of distribution models, even in situations where you know there's houses. So um, so one, just one other quick follow-up on that. So you talked about the frequency of artifacts and kind of hitting yeah. a wall at which, you know, there's the structural uh, exterior yeah. and, but something that, that Binford also talked about in his drop and toss zone kind of model is, or maybe if it was Binford specifically, but someone else, was the size of artifacts, right? There should be a size yes. change. This All the big stuff goes outside quickly and little stuff gets embedded in a floor service. Is there any data you had on that? Or maybe I missed it in the talk. Uh, I didn't specifically talk about it. You're talking about this. I think the centrifuge effect is it's sometimes called where like the big stuff goes further out and the small stuff stays closer in. Um, the best that we can talk about this is in this block D. So basically everywhere outside of block D, if you have a piece of lithic stone tool that is bigger than like this, it's a tool. Um, almost, you know, we have thousands of artifacts on the site. The vast majority of them are micro devotons. They're under a centimeter in size. So you, it's really hard to do something like a, like a kind of size class analysis for how so far stuff out is because we don't have that much big stuff. Much we can talk about that is this block D area. And what you'll see is that the outlines, I'm sure I wish this map was a little bit bigger, but the outlines are um, bone and almost all of them are further out from where that hearth probably is, which is consistent with them being probably actually outside the walls um, of the space. Um, and also we see, so this dense concentration, the light gray is lithics. Um, this is actually a flake pile, probably from one or a few or like a swept up debitage flint napping event. Uh, and that also is on kind of the edge of these distributions, which is once again, kind of more consistent with this being an interior space um, than an exterior space uh, and also suggesting some kind of uh, maintenance of that space, certainly. Madeline. Okay, great. Thanks. It's, it's, yeah, I appreciate the careful analysis. It's really interesting stuff. And I've taken up way more of your time than I should have. So I'll oh, hand it off. I enjoy anyway. questions. I don't care. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, um, from looking at all this stuff, does this look like it was multiple year type thing by the, the, uh, the landscape around there? Like this was the killing zone that they could drive the mammoths into this area and, and, and kill them at, at this site that they could herd them in there and then and then uh, use it because otherwise, you know, a mammoth is a big thing. You, you don't lead them to with a butchery site and maybe you just yeah. find them. And, and that's where they ended up dying after you stabbed them a number of times. But if there was some stuff around the landscape there that would indicate that they could drive them into that area and then kill them. Sure. So one, one challenge with kind of some of the spatial stuff on this site Oh, this photo works is so this is where Lacrell Creek is today. Um, and remember, this site was found because it was eroding out. So we've lost some portion of the site. We have no idea what was in it. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and there's actually a historic railroad trestle that isn't in any of the photos that's just outside of the frame. And probably when that was constructed, it changed the course of the creek a little bit um, and could probably kind of may have contributed to like uh, eroding out some of the site or not. Um, you would not move the mammoth after it died. You are correct. Where it landed was where it landed. Um, as far as how people hunted mammoths, that's actually a question that we don't really have an answer to. There is a number of ethnographic accounts of people hunting elephants. Um, and we can hypothesize that some of them may have been similar to how Clovis hunted uh, mammoths, but we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, thing to remember is that, yes, yeah, something like an arroyo is a possibility. This was not an arroyo, um, but also something like injuring and then following until the animal dies um, is something that is possible. Um, mm -hmm. And that could have been uh, kind of in this case. Now, another interesting thing that you mentioned was like, is this area full of mammoths? So this, as I mentioned, this is about a mile from the Platte River, which is a major waterway in this portion. Um, and a number of other mammoth remains have come out in this region. I know of at least four or five other mammoth sites, which probably means there's a ton of unreported and undiscovered ones. Um, that are all within like 15 miles of this site. Um, and we don't know, we've been trying to track down the specific locations for all of those. And we found specific locations for some of them. And we know that some of them are certainly paleontological. It's possible. There is an, at least one other one that's Clovis aged. We have not tested it. It's possible that it's um, also archeological, but it's really a question mark. Um, and we have no, no, no material, no cultural materials have ever been found with it. Um, but um, it's it's possible that this area was known as like a good place to hunt mammoths or a good place to be during a certain time of the year, right? And so it may be that maybe part of the reason why we potentially could be see, seeing people come together at this location is because like that's where you went during that time of the year. And if you take down a mammoth, that is a massive amount of a resource, right? That's more than probably one um, one community would maybe use. Um, so it could be that this was known for being a hotspot of mammoths, and it does seem like there is more mammoths on kind of the eastern portion of Wyoming, and this actually includes all the way down the front range into Colorado, um, and you can see that if you look at the maps of kind of Clovis sites with mammoth remains of them. Sorry, I like animations. Um, in the sense that a lot of these sites are right kind of on this Western Plains, Eastern side of the Rockies, right? And there's a mm -hmm. lot of mammoth sites, period, just paleontological included, that are in this region. Um, and so certainly this could be like one, seen as one of the better places to hunt. Um, that's definitely a potential. It's certainly not um, the easiest question to address with like direct data, um, but it's certainly a possibility. Okay, thanks. So were you able to tell what the climate was when these people were hunting these mammoths? So we've done, I mean, certainly there's been a lot of regional work um, done on kind of what the Pleistocene was like um, in Wyoming, where we do see it was a little bit um, colder, potentially a little bit winter um, than what we see. Um, as far as um, on local onsite itself, there was just a University of Wyoming master's student, McKenna Latinsky, um, who's been doing a lot of work with our microfauna, so like rodents. Um, and she found that all of the, from my recollection, which hopefully I'm not wrong on this, uh, all of the rodent species um, that were found during the Pleistocene at Laprelle are still in that range today. Um, so kind of close, probably. Um, we also know that um, we've had a little bit of identification done on our um, charcoal, um, and I think it was, oh, I'm blanking on what it was off the top of my head. I apologize. It's um, middle of the week. Uh, but it's a tree species that we see in the general region as well. So probably certainly a little bit cooler um, than we would see today, uh, but not like dramatically different, probably. As far as what the immediate vegetation was on site, we haven't done a reconstruction yet. Um, it's something we'd like to do uh, and we're hoping to do so that we can kind of talk about if it was still 
you know, if it was more treed or less treed than what we see presently. Um, but we, I can't tell you a good answer for it yet. Hi. Hi. I hope this isn't a dumb question. Um, you mentioned the red ochre. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is a long time ago. Um, and you mentioned one other thing, and I'm sorry, it slipped my mind, that made me think that there, there, there was trade. Was there trade? Do we have any indication that there's trade? Um, certainly there was trade, right? We know there must have been trade. A really hard question to get at always in archaeology is, is it trade or is it um, is it direct procurement, going and getting it and bringing it back, right? That's always something that's really hard to answer in archaeology. Um, as far as I can tell, or as far as we can tell, we lean towards this being direct procurement, someone going and getting this, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, we know that Clovis people on the plains and in other portions of the continent moved really far really often. Right, like we consistently see stone tools moving hundred stone tools moving hundreds of miles from their sources. Um, so it's not unrealistic to think that they would um, kind of move materials like this really far. The other reason why I say this is because this red ochre stain that we see here, um, the stone tools that are around it, these that are pictured here, these are definitely from the Hartville uplift. Um, like this, particularly this butterscotch shirt with dendrites. Um, and this, this red shirt is actually, um, this shirt that has, or it's what color that turns when it gets heated. Um, and this was clearly like thrown in a fire at some point, which is why it has this crazy fracture at the bottom. Um, and also this, this shirt is also Harpville Uplift for those dendrites for sure. Um, and so we know that these all came from the Harpville Uplift and we ran some, um, chemical analyses on this ochre using ICP OES. Um, and chemically, based off some of the small trace elements in it, it seems like it is most consistent with Hartville Uplift ochre as well. It's not a dead ringer, um, but it's it's closer to Hartville Uplift. And we compared um, that to ochre that was found actually in Laprell Creek. This is definitely not Laprell Creek ochre. We have absolutely confirmed that. Um, and also from another ochre source that is known mostly historically, which is the Rollins Red source. Um, which is located outside of Rollins, Wyoming, which is in kind of the south central central uh, southwestern portion of the state. Um, and it's definitely not that. So kind of all of those things together suggest that this is probably um, direct, kind of going to that place and then bringing it back. I will say this would have been a, a pretty good pouch of ochre um, that would have been brought. This is more than, you know, this is an intentional amount that would have been brought in. It's not you know, just like a chunk that was broken up. It's it's a lot of ochre. It's actually so much ochre that it stained the sediments like pink. Like you would go to screen and they would turn pink. It was really wild to watch um, for a lot of days. And do you have any thoughts? I mean, that ochre was kind of ceremonial, right? Or do you have any thoughts about why that would be there? Yeah, this is a this is a fantastic question, which we have talked about a lot. You know, what what is this? And you can think of this in two different ways. You know, we can talk about functional uses of ochre, um, but we can also talk about how it can be ritualistic or have greater meaning, um, or it can be both of those things, right? Certainly, both of those are probably most likely. Um, as far as like the functional explanation, um, one thing that definitely um, we need to do more work on is kind of what is the large variety of things, the functional explanations that we see for different people using ochre. Um, one that immediately comes to mind, given that we have um, bow needles on site, is hide processing, hide coloring. Um, there's also um, ochre uh, can be used in actually like tanning and hide processing um, as well, which is certainly something that could be done. It could also be used for painting. Um, painting ritualistically, painting kids, kids playing with something they're not supposed to uh, is an explanation we have often also talked about. Um, but we also know that ochre is really, really important for a lot of indigenous communities, including indigenous communities from this region. 
Um, and, you know, those, these are often things that are still used by indigenous communities today. And red is a very powerful color for a lot of communities. So certainly both, both of those things are probably most likely, um, you know, we may be able to get to one of them, but in all honesty, it's probably going to end up being kind of what our best, best guess is given uh, its context. Thank you. Um, I just realized that there were chat questions. So let me answer uh, one of those. Um, which I think the first one came in, I'm assuming what talking about this chopper tool um, and asking if it is uh, a quartz site. Um, and uh, so this uh, this is uh, my recollection is a quartz site um, and probably is from taken from straight off of site. We have cobbles just like this found in Laprelle Creek, um, you know, obviously in its current state and not in the Pleistocene levels naturally. Um, but there are kind of these rocks all over kind of down in the creek bed itself today. So this was probably something that was made immediately on site by someone for busting up um, mammoth remains uh, or kind of whatever else you need a big heavy tool for. One thing I will say is that um, chopping tools like this that are made off of local materials that are found right on site are also found at other uh, mammoth hunting sites in North America. Um, <laughs> I think, I think out of those 14 mammoth hunting sites we have, at least six of them have tools that look just like this. Um, so this is probably something that was pretty consistently used in these toolkits for a large game um, processing, which is really interesting. Um, and then someone had a question about radiocarbon dates um, and if they were calibrated. So the chart that I showed here, um, the age on the right are um, in radiocarbon years before present, and these are in calibrated years. Um, so this estimate up here is Cal BP. Um, and this falls right within that um, Clovis chronology. Um, if you use the short chronology or if you use the, the large chronology, it's basically right in the center of that. Um, so um, I thought I would mention that since someone asked. Any other questions? You've answered my questions and you did a really good report and I sat here and listened to the whole thing. And that's a miracle because I have ADHD and I can't sit still for five minutes. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I try my best to make it interesting and understandable. Yeah. It's, you know, and I started to ask a question about the climate, but the other lady did and you answered. So there was no need to my interrupt there. Thank you a lot. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Oh. And I'll second that. It, here, here. Fabulous ton of information very so uh so very well nice. done thank you very much madeline are, are you a professor at the university of wyoming no so i'm at weber state which is uh north of salt lake um i oh, did yeah. uh i did my phd at the university of wyoming partially on this site and i still work on the site um continually so all right very good work thank you madeline Madeline, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Finally got back in. Sorry for that. This is probably one of our best Penwas programs. 